Okay. Hello. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're all uh, caffeinated this morning. I've been very impressed with the uh, quality of some of the uh, local coffee shops, actually. Uh, I've become a bit of a coffee aficionado uh, recently. It's been really nice to try some uh, different um, filter coffees. So uh, let me begin. So my name is Robert Bradford. I uh, work at Intel. Uh, I've been working in open source uh, professionally for around 15 years now. And most recently, I've been working in the space of virtualization. Uh, a few years ago, I presented here at KVM Forum uh, back in uh, Edinburgh uh, about um, uh, Rust hypervisor firmware, which was one of the projects that I started to start on my journey learning Rust and uh, looking at different ways we can boot virtual machines. Um, but most recently, I've been working on Cloud Hypervisor as one of the maintainers there, which is a uh, VMM written in Rust using the Rust uh, VMM crates. And today, I'm going to talk about my most recent work, which was looking into seeing how quickly we can boot a VM into user space and um, trying to achieve that in 100 milliseconds. And the answer was, yeah, I could do it in 64 milliseconds. Um, so thank you, everybody. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> um, no all seriousness, you've got to take every number you see with a pinch of salt. So this was the number that I achieved on my um, nice new Alder Lake desktop, uh, big upgrade from my Haswell system before. But your numbers will vary, right? I found that I actually had pretty stable numbers, but I had a lot of variance over uh, what other workloads I was running at the same time, um, just, you know, <laughs> so I found that I would repeat the, the test several times. But what I want to say is, I think the number that I set out, 100 per second, is definitely achievable, and I'm gonna present some of the sort of steps along the way of reaching that and some of the challenges that I've had. Um, but don't, fix, you know, don't obsess about the explicit numbers too much. So why do we want to boot quickly? Well, increasingly, there's a use of uh, functions as a service, containers as a service. If you look at um, functionality like AWS Lambda and, and, and uh, the equivalents that you get on GCP and Azure, they want to be able to encapsulate those workloads in a VM but for protection. Um, but they still need to be able to serve those quickly. Um, that can result in an improved user experience for the users if those sites respond very quickly. But also, you know, in the, in, in the current climate, we want to make sure that we are focused on minimizing our resource consumption as well. Like, in general, anything that we can do for optimization will help with power consumption as well. Um, one thing that I learned with some of the optimizations that I was looking at have also improved um, the steady state performance. So that's also useful for things that beyond the actual initial booting. And don't, let's not undervalue the just intellectual curiosity of looking into a problem and coming up with a solution. I think that's a really strong motivator for me in, in this kind of situation. So what do I define by the boot time here? Well, I'm, at, I'm looking at the situation where I'm directly booting into the kernel. So I'm not going through a, through a firmware um, or a bootloader, so I'm going to be using the, um, the, the, the uh, in cloud hypervisor, we support the Linux PVH, um, so we directly boot into the VM Linux, and I'm ignoring the management layer, which might have come in through, so something like using libvirt or, or um, you know, uh, cat containers, or anything like that that's on top of that, and I'm also disregarding what's going on in terms of the user space side of things. I'm really just focused on from starting the VMM to running the first instruction in user space. So that's the kind of time window that I'm most interested in. And that's what I'm looking at right now. So how do I measure that time? Well, the easiest way to do that was to instrument the kernel, because we're running our own, our own custom kernel here, so because we're directly booting into the kernel, to do something to, so that the VMM can recognize that. And the easiest way is to trigger a VM exit, and one of the easiest ways to do that is to write to the uh, I/O port. We use the debug, the Zero X N A debug, and inside Cloud Hypervisor, we have we catch that and we trigger a log event at that point in time. So it's very easy to measure that time because we've got the we, our logging start, start starts from the very start of the VMM. 
There are other alternative approaches. You can actually use um, QM, uh, the KVM probing to um, track on the, uh, the actual PIO exit as well, and you can get a timestamp from there as well. Um, so a, that's a link here, which these slides are up updated on the website, so you can use this material as for that. Um, so there are, sev there are several different ways to analyze that number that we got and how we can go about improving that. And like you can split this into two different ideas. So we can look at things from the frequency domain. So how often does this thing occur? So a great tool for using that would be for using just using perf, just either as the standard, um, you know, measuring the the the, um, the the stochastic counters and just looking at the cool graph, or we can actually have some explicit counters for um, the the VM exits. Um, so in Cloud Advisor, we have a counter for the VM exits, but also you can um, go with perf. You could actually say, well, I want to look at the particularly types of KVM situations and KVM exits as well. Or you can look at things from the time domain. So you can look at the tracing, and I built some custom tracing infrastructure to generate this output. Um, the logs from the VMM, so we have some key part, points of time in our VMM where we, we output some logs, and we, you can reference those back. And actually, the guess, the message, if you have it compiled with the timestamps in, gives a really close approximation to that original boot time if you know how long your your uh, time before executing the kernel is. So you can then experiment with just looking at that. That was a really useful uh, approximation to see if things were making any difference without the overhead. So this is my initial test. This is pretty much the sort of a standard recommended kernel, uh, you know, cloud hypervisor configuration. And where we're outputting to the serial port and we're booting with uh, a Verso block device. Now we have, we use, um, IOU ring in our block device, so it's pretty good performance from in terms of like throughput and latency. Um, but this, with this configuration, it resulted in boot time of 166 milliseconds, which was not the 64 milliseconds I quoted earlier, and it's not above, uh, below the 100 milliseconds, which was the goal that I set out when I started this work. So, well, okay, we'll have to do work better. So. I loaded up perf. So here we are looking at things in terms of the uh, frequency domain. I'm sorry, you'll need to make sure you go and see, if you can't see this, you don't need to go and see your uh, optometrist. It's, uh, it is very small and very quite, it is quite blurry as well. Um, but basically this shows that we were getting a lot of PIO exits from the serial port. And every time we were getting a being of that, we were having to handle that in Cloud Hypervisor. We were having to do uh, some bus walk-ups, which uh, walk-throughs, which is like a, a standard thing that all the Rust VMM um, VMMs use this common bus infrastructure that originally came from CrossVM. That has a small cost for walking those to find the underlying device to handle the PIO exits. So we want to minimize those PIO exits. So the easiest way to do that was to switch to Vertio console. So you do miss the early logging prior to the console being initialized, the Verto console being initialized. Um, but we, since we're directly booting into the kernel, we're less interested in things like the um, firmware control and firmware logging. So not having the serial port is not a big disadvantage. And when I do that, I went below the 100 milliseconds on my test machine. So that was a bit really big. Removing the PIOs was a really, for the serial port was a really big improvement. Not just from the VM exits, but also from all the handling that we were doing behind the scenes to actually output that serial. So, but we can go a little bit further. If we actually add quiet to the kernel command line, remember we have the kernel command line in our control because we're directly booting the kernel. And if you're in your, um, your framework for CAS containers or whatever framework you might be using for a function as a service or as a container or as a service workload, you can, you will have control of that command line as well. And you don't necessarily need that output. It might not be particularly helpful. So that also shaves some time off the metric there. So we're getting closer to what I was hoping when I reread my uh, talk proposal was the 50 millisecond goal that I maybe can outline. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. So we're, get, we're getting a big improvement there. But then when I started looking at the uh, analysis using Perf again, uh, we had a big increase in the number of amount of activity happening on our Vertio block device. 
So this was now we were being bottlenecked by the, uh, the handling and of the, for the block device. Now, in Cloud Hypervisor, we also implement a PMEM device, which has far fewer exits triggered because the reads and writes don't need to go onto a vert IO queue. Instead, the memory is memory mapped directly into the guest. So there is still, there is still some uh, use of the queue for, uh, the queue for, for signaling flushing, but it's much reduced. And during boot, we get far fewer, uh, act, much less activity on the, uh, you know, on the, on the equivalent vert OMM thread. So this increased, but this increased the boot time. So I was like, ah, oh, that's frustrating. But then when I look at the profile, so it's always good to reevaluate the profile after every single time. Now I'm seeing the cost coming from the uh, mapping those pages into the guest. So, for, for, so that so I was like, okay, how can we evolve on there? Well, what happens if we use huge pages? Right, we know that the VM is going to be of uh, reasonable size. We know that the it's going to work things in a particular manner. Huge pages would be a perfect choice for this. And so, we if you enable huge pages, the the, the boot time improves to 64 milliseconds, which was that time that I quoted there. Um, as an interest, I tried what happens when you go to one gig huge pages it gets worse again. And that's just from zeroing all that memory that you don't necessarily need at boot time. So two make your pages was the sweet spot for booting the VM. So I did a little bit more analysis and I found, I, and so I, I was looking at this, so I, what I was, what, it confirmed the idea that I had, which was that the VM exits were the cause of the slowness during the boot time. And as we can see, the number of VM exits drops as we move through from the, uh, the worst case with the serial port and doing the PIO exits related to that, and then the related um, exits relating to the memory, and then all the way through to the huge pages where the, most, you know, where the amount of uh, VM exits is significantly reduced. But what about huge, uh, 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 THP? Well, I don't know if anyone has any other experience of working with THP. I could not get it to work for our use case at all. Um, in theory, like, I, it reminded me of this quote for, about SCSI, um, that transparent huge pages, it should work. I think it might be some interaction between the fact we use MemFD, uh, create MemFD for creating our, our file descriptor for our memory, but at no point can I ever coerce anything to use THP, even, uh, even after asking some experts and exploring. So I would actually love to get some feedback if there's a way of trying, uh, of trying to make THP work. So one thing I did was I went through our history and I looked at our boot time using one of our automated tools for tracking our performance. And um, I spotted some changes in our boot time going all the way back from 2021 in March all the way to the current version. And we had some improvements. Um, the uh, very astute and eagle-eyed uh, amongst you will recognize that those time, some of those times are actually below 50 milliseconds. And that's because this test suite that we use is part of our automated testing. Um, avoid, wants to avoid the discrepancy from any underlying performance of the block device. So it um, uses a tempfs for booting the uh, files, uh, for the file system for the guest, and which if that tempfs is then going into PMEM, you're gonna get very, very good performance. Um, so what optimizations did I make in leading to that change? Well, there were a few key optimizations. So the first thing was that when I did an analysis, I discovered a lot of probing off for the PCI, on the PC, for the PCI buses beyond the first PCI bus. So um, that was like an interesting problem since we only had one PCI bus at the time. Um, Again, I mentioned earlier that like uh, Firecracker and CrossVM, we have a very we have a common way of looking up our devices on this on this bus object and then finding the underlying device, which is very relevant for serial devices and for the PCI config I/O port. Um, and I wanted to like work out a way of optimizing that. And actually, loading in the kernel was uh, quite a piece of time. 
So since we only supported one bus, one bus per segment, we support up to 16 segments, the M MCFG static table actually has, a, you can say how many buses are associated with an individual segment, an individual host bridge controller that that is for. And by changing that from uh, 255 or whatever, not to, however many it is, down to, to, uh, to, to one, the uh, boot time significantly improved as the kernel was no longer probing for all those devices that don't exist. So I had a little look uh, at some of the other uh, Rust VMMs that use this. Um, Firecracker doesn't yet have PCI support, so that doesn't apply. In Cross VM, the bus size is calculated from the PCI uh, MMIO config size. So that might be the, it might be better to calculate it the other way around, and so they could actually, since I don't think they support multiple buses themselves. So that might be an improvement that they can apply there. But doing that improves the performance significantly in terms of skipping the extra probing that we just don't need to do because we don't have any devices on those extra buses. Um, the PCIO fast path was also really important. So simply by, at the point at which we get a VM exit, if we just quickly check to see if the IO port matches the PCI config IO port, we can um, just bypass that and go straight into the PCI config IO device and look things up. And the combination of those two led to a big improvement in the, in the boot time. So that, with the same config that I was talking about earlier, that gave a 37% improvement. So just, make, just, just optimizing that PCA config probing and discovery, which was so significant during the boot, gave this really significant improvement. So I wanted to look at some things outside of the frequency domains. The majority of what I'd done in terms of profiling and performance analysis using tools like Perf had been looking at that frequency domain. So I wanted to get like a nice um, trace graph, a little bit like boot chart, but for the cloud hypervisor start. Now I could get quite a long way, as I said, just because by looking at our logs, because our logs uh, print out the time relative to the start of the VMM. But I wanted to go a bit further. So I added some trace points uh, and built a little tracing point infrastructure into Cloud Hypervisor and then wrote a Python script to generate an SVG, um, which was surprisingly difficult, actually, um, getting the kind of colors to look re halfway readable. Um, and this is what led to the inspiration of, like, well, what happens if we load the kernel asynchronously? So in this particular situation, um, we load the kernel in a separate thread. Um, that's just reading it from the disk and putting it in. And at the same time, we can do some of the device creation. Now, on a very simple VM design without, with only a few devices, we, it doesn't take too long. But if you start to add a lot of network devices, maybe you've got some VFIO devices or a VFIO user device, VPPA device, or lots of different segments, the time for taking that uh, um, swells and actually you get much more of an advantage out of the asynchronous kernel loading. Right now, um, the function entry point that's here, that is the predominantly waiting for the, the, the kernel process to, the kernel loader thread to finish. So we got some benefit of imperialization. The benefit increases with the more complex config that you have. Um, so that was kind of qu quite interesting. I'm really hopeful that I can add tracing to other places to really uh, look at other specific situations as we have as well beyond just boot. Um, but it's all good that we've, I've done this as a one-off experiment to find uh, you know, what the boot time is right now and aim for this goal. Well, so we wanted to have a way of monitoring what was going on with our performance, not just for boot time actually, going beyond that in terms of starting time for like, um, for throughput, for, for, for block and net, latency for network. Um, so we've got this metrics, you can go and visit this website, it has this fancy graph showing the, the metrics. Um, so we run the metrics suite on a, on a bare metal machine and we use that to kind of give us some good information about whether our, our patches are, are good quality, whether there's any big regressions, and you know, here is a great example of where it showed something really valuable. Um, actually, there's this big peak here, right, where um, the, the boot time went from about, on, the, on this particular, this is an Ice Lake server, 
So this is um, not necessarily got the highest clock speed, uh, but it's obviously got a lot of cores. So that's why the number is higher like in terms of absolute time than, than, uh, than I would see it in terms of like what I was getting on my, on my desktop system. But this, this, speak, this peak uh, occurred a few days after, uh, or a few builds after, I was looking at adding support for a uh, updated kernel. So then I had to go ahead and uh, find out what was going on, and I was able to bisect the kernel to this ch particular change. Um, it doesn't look particularly, it looks particularly innocuous. I'm still looking into exactly why this, this change broke it. So I w went back and I stopped using the latest kernel. Um, so it's really interesting that we've got, you know, the ability to run this automated tooling both for uh, regular building, but also for actually being able to bisect a particular situation. So, kind of, how can we go below 50 milliseconds? Well, I did actually achieve that, but I had to take some extreme measures. I had to disable networking in the kernel. Um, it, so, but that's kind of, I thought, well, you could have like a function as a service. There was a function as a service system I was looking at, which worked entirely on starting, a bind, uh, starting the thing, uh, spending in, standard in and standard out, and then sending that over the HTTP. But then I realized if you had a function that can't access any network resources, it, it's not especially useful. Um, so I think you kind of do need to have the networking. You can possibly go a bit further with uh, really, really fast storage. So if you have something that was like uh, a PMEM, persistent memory style storage, um, like you can actually improve that and get closer to that boot time, as we saw with the boot time when it's running directly off the RAM in TempFS, you do get the, below the 50 milliseconds. But we already have quite a slim uh, bind, uh, kernel inside Cloud Hypervisor for the reference kernel. So I think it's doable, uh, and as clock speeds improve, as IPC improves, you're gonna get better and better. And the same mechanisms that we've talked about can be continued to use for optimization. So in summary, the custom tooling, that was a really interesting exercise and showed some useful information. Um, it demonstrates that, for instance, creating the ACPI tables aren't a huge cause of the cost. Um, but it was instead that maybe working out how to do it more work asynchronously is valuable. But then I was telling some of my colleagues in the Cata, uh, Cata Containers project, like, yeah, we're working to optimize the boot of the VM from from uh, well, 150 milliseconds down to 100 milliseconds and below. And they were like, yeah, doesn't really help. Like were, they were talking of the order of multiple seconds for the get starting up, the leading to the start of the VMs through Kubernetes. So um, I feel like uh, that was okay. It was still a good experiment to do. Um, I also had a preview of the latest, I tried the latest uh, uh, 6.0 RC. I know it's, uh, I know it's since released. And the boot time shot up to 240 milliseconds through some um, new uh, speculative execution prevention mechanisms, which was a bit unfortunate. So maybe, maybe we're not gonna actually be able to keep achieving that goal if we wanna continue with those kernel updates. But there's still the value of the, of the automated monitoring that I have, and that's really, really useful for helping us understand what's going on. And, um, there's also the, the value of the learning exercise from that. The um, booting fast, I want to say, can sometimes be used as an alternative to templating. There's a lot of excitement for templating and starting VMs quickly, um, but I think that some, by, by taking a, the copy of an existing running VM and starting a new one, but I, I think that possibly um, you'd be able to just boot directly to solve that problem. Thank you very much. Any questions? Great, the question was, did I compare different sizes of VM based on the core count and different sizes of memory? Um, they, I, I, I did as an interesting value, I did look at those things. They do scale as you would expect. Um, it's not linear, but they do scale as you expect. But for the purpose that I was looking at, within the range that I was looking at for those particular situations with sort of function as a service style workloads, 
the boot, uh, within the range of about 512 to say four gig of RAM, there was very little difference. And when you were looking at two to four, you know, two to four CPUs, it didn't make a difference. If you scale up to a very large number of CPUs and a very large amount of RAM, then yes, you do get some differences. But within the range that makes sense for a kind of a function as a service or a containers as a service workload, I didn't see enough variation to want to put it in the material here. Okay, great question. So what, okay. So the question was, can I give details about the kernel config? So we use the, the PVH added infrastructure. So that takes the VM Linux dot bin directly. So that's an uncompressed binary. Um, so it's about, I think it's about 48 megs in the testing I was using. This kernel is the sort of standard kernel that we have published the config for, and it's our recommended config. It, it doesn't, it's uh, currently based on 5.15. It is just the right set of devices for running with Cloud Hyperos and Verti devices. It doesn't have a lot of excessive functionality in it. And you had a second question. And about the image, so if you use the Instagram attached or? No, great question. Okay, so we're booting directly in, so the question was about whether I was using init RAM FS. Because I'm not using a, um, a, a booting into, a, into the OS and into the bootloader, I'm not using an init RAMFS. The, the command line boots has a root equal slash dev VDA and there's no init RAMFS in use. Um, that would be an interesting exercise if you had a particular um, kind of workload where you could keep all your interesting logic inside the init RAMFS and maybe have a large-ish init RAMFS and perhaps a, a, a temporary persistent storage or network-based persistent storage or not have any persistent storage that might lead to an interesting situation where you could get almost the same performance as you would be getting from the, um, from the kind of booting directly from, from RAM situation. Of course, you've had to load that in RAM first in, into memory, but if it's already in your cache, that would be useful. Um, so the question was, did I look at the reason for the, uh, the causes of those PI exits and how much time I was spending in them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but particularly for the, so in terms of, although I'm focused in those exits, if I can bring up the slide, hopefully it's got here. Um, of these exits, actually only the, very few of those will actually result into the, going into the uh, VMM itself. Some, a lot of those will be handled by a KVM. And I was looking at areas that I can, as cloud hypervisor, can work to optimize. So I did have some monitoring of how long I was spending inside the PCI and serial uh, exits, um, but it wasn't of particular interest. It, it sort of demonstrated as much as you would expect. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that sounds really interesting. Maybe we can have a chat about that later. That would be really cool. Okay, so that was a good recommendation for like mapping the, um, so the re there was a recommendation to map the address space that we use for PCIe, the config thing, directly into the guest, rather than having it, um, using the PIO probing. Um, we kind of need the PIO because we've got, we do support firmwares, and so <laughs> they do want to do very simple stuff like access it via PIO, so it's a difficult compromise. But that's actually quite a fun idea. Are there any other questions? <laughs>
Mm -hmm. um, would it work for you? Because like, I remember reading some papers about like very fast live snapshots or cloning of the actual plot with this some kind of fork mechanism where mm -hmm. you use copy and write and all of that stuff. Did you consider that as, as well? Doesn't it like fix your use case? Your so uh, Cloud Hypervisor does support those situations, those use cases already. Um, so the question was about whether, about a little bit more detail about uh, VM forking or um, using uh, uh, copyright snapshots for fast snapshotting. Um, so the, in Cloud Hypervisor, we do support that functionality. We, when you snapshot out the, the VM, you can then, and you, can, you boot it again from the same snapshot, those have copyright mappings of the underlying RAM. And we also support like, uh, very fast live migration into a new VM using um, by sharing the um, memory file descriptors for the guest again. So you can also, as well as actually having to snapshot it out, you can actually just like live migrate it into a new copy. Um, those are, I some, I, I'm not convinced about the value of templating, although VM forking where you can actually sh do better address space sharing might be really valuable. I think sometimes templating is used to work around problems from the slow boot. And I wanted to see if we could look at say, hey, if we boot quickly, maybe we can avoid the complexity of the templating. Because um, once you get, te with templating, you, you do have other potential issues in terms of like, well, what about the guest MAC address or the block storage and things like that. So maybe booting can mitigate some of that if your situation would allow you to do that. But I agree, you can get really fast startup times um, with, especially if you, if you wanna actually, uh, if you're templating with a living program in user space, the, the, maybe your user space program takes a long time to run, their VM templating might be really valuable because you can just template with the user space. And in this case, you, definitely, this, you, you wouldn't care about how long it boots because you can do that. So. Uh, I do know people who are using Cloud Hypervisor with a long running template user space and then uh, basically hot plugging the network device in and hot plugging the, uh, a separate persistent storage device in so that, so for their like, data, but otherwise they use a, a read only root FS. So that's how they achieve the, avoiding all the problems by hot plugging in their later devices. Wonderful. So, no more questions. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Cheers. <laughs>